your preacher told me that you're in this series called Rooted, where you're looking at um, what it means to have roots deep down into Jesus Christ and then what it means to be rooted with one another. And today, what I want to talk to you about is what it means to be rooted in your neighborhood. What does it look like to put down roots in your neighborhood that go deep, that are connected to the people who live right around you? For the last 25 years, Tracy, my wife, Tracy and I, we've lived primarily in two places. We lived in Northeast Indiana for 10 years, and then we've lived in Lansing, Michigan for the last, I don't know, 15 or 16 years or so. But before that, the first 10 years of our marriage, we moved 11 times. I'm going to tell you, when you move 11 times in 10 years, it's tough to put down any roots. It's tough to get to know people. Now, it's interesting that Americans are moving less than they used to. In fact, fewer Americans moved last year than at any time since 1948. So the trend of Americans moving is, is, is going down. Nevertheless, 27 million Americans still moved someplace new last year. And the average American will move 12 times in his or her lifetime. And the majority of those people moving are, you know, people, what you would expect. They're people who are younger, people who are age 20 to 29. They're going off to college, and so they move to college, or they've completed college, and so they're going to, they're moving uh, to, you know, where they're going to do their work, or maybe moving back home, or maybe there's someone, you know, they move, they go to serve in the military, and so they move a whole lot, you know, in those years from age 20 to 29, right? We're still moving a lot, and with so many Americans moving, maybe... Maybe you begin to wonder what I've wondered at different times in my life. Why bother putting down roots? I mean, why bother getting to know your neighbor? Why bother, you know, putting down roots in your neighborhood? Because after all, you're just going to move anyway, right? You're likely to move anyway, and you put down roots, and you build those relationships, and then you have to say goodbye, and goodbyes are hard. And not only that, but putting down roots is hard work, it really is. I remember one time we moved from one place to another, and uh, I, I, I still happened to drive part of the same way to work every day. And so after driving this same route uh, for a long time, and then we moved to a different house, I, I got back on the highway to go to work, and I actually took the wrong exit because I was just so automatically in tune. You, ever, you know, do that, you kind of put your car on autopilot. I, I just took the wrong exit because putting down roots and integrating into a new community, it can be really hard work. And so a lot of times we just wonder, is it really worth it? Is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, do we really want to go to the hard work of putting down roots? Why bother rooting in a new community or in a neighborhood? Why go to all the work of forming relationships? Well, I think the reason why, friends, is because putting down roots is necessary to growing the kingdom of God. And when Jesus said, as you're going into all the world, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all these things. When Jesus said that, a necessary part of that is for you and I to put down roots to become integrated into a community. Now, the good news is this. It doesn't take extensive training to learn how to put down roots in your community. You don't have to go to a class. You don't have to sign up for something. And the even better news is that the, the motive and the method for putting down roots are the same. The motive and method are the same. The motive for putting down roots in a community and the method for putting down roots in a community is love. Love is the reason, it's the motive we put down roots in a community, it's also the way we put down roots in a community. And if you're a Christian, I'm guessing that at some point someone has introduced you into the two greatest commandments that Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 12, and that's where we're going to be today. If you've got your analog Bible, turn to Mark chapter 12, or you can click there on your mobile device, or it'll be on the screen behind me. Mark chapter 12, we're going to start out in verse 29 today, we're going to camp there a little while. So Jesus said, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. 
It was some time ago that I took a survey. I surveyed 210 people. So it was a you know, fairly valid survey. And those 210 people were all asked this. Jesus taught his followers to love your neighbor as yourself. How important do you think this commandment is for Christians to follow? That's what I asked. I said, hey, Jesus said you should love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, how many of you think this, uh, how important is that command for you to follow? By the way, these were all 210 people who are all part of a church, right? Um, how many, how many of you think percentage wise, percentage wise, what percent do you think said that was important? Just shout it out. 15, 30, how many? 40, 40 how many? Anybody higher than 50? Well, believe it or not, when I said to church people now, Jesus said the most important command is, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. How important is that command? 99% of those people said it's either important or very important. And I'll bet, I'll bet if I take the survey here today, I'd get similar numbers. I'll bet if I said, how important it is to love your neighbor as yourself, I'll bet 99% would say, well, Jesus said it, so it must be important. So yeah, it's either important or very important. Here's the thing. While 99% said it's either important or very important, 47% said they never pray for their neighbor. What? 90%. 90%, now nine out of 10 said they pray for their six nearest neighbors less than six, or rather less than five times in a typical month. Nearly one fourth of respondents don't know if their neighbors are Christians or not. And get this, 25%, one out of every four don't know the names of their six nearest neighbors. Now, the fancy term for that is what we call cognitive dissonance. When you know one thing, but you do something else. So this is, this is dissonant, right? So if 99% say, yeah, this is important, love your neighbor as yourself, but only 25% even know their names, I mean, come on, what are we doing? Now, if we all can agree that this is important, but we don't know our neighbor's names or we don't pray for our neighbors, then what does that say about our level of obedience? I get it. You're saying, hey, preacher, but <laughs> preacher, you don't know my neighbor, right? What if your neighbor's incredibly obnoxious? What if your neighbor has a really messed up and complicated life and you just don't want to get caught up in the drama? I get it. I understand. What if you're only passing through your neighborhood, right? You're on your way to something else. I mean, you got your, you got your starter house. You got your starter neighbors, right? You're just going to be there a while and then you're going to move on to something else. So, you know, why go to the work? And if any of that describes you, you're a lot like a guy that we meet in Luke chapter 10, in Luke's account of, of Jesus telling of this. We meet this guy in Luke 10 who's looking for loopholes. And if we're honest, and if we're just really honest and, and we admit it, I, I think a lot of times when we read scripture, we're looking for loopholes too. Here's a guy looking for loopholes. And we read this story and we think, Jesus, okay, I get it. Jesus says, love your neighbor. But what if, what if Jesus didn't just mean love your neighbor? What if he also meant love your next door neighbor? Would that change your perspective on this passage? What if Jesus didn't mean, hey, love your neighbor, but he meant also love your next door neighbor. Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So right off the bat, we learned that this guy's a lawyer, right? Uh, Jesus tells us an expert in religious law. That's what he does. He's a, he's a legal attorney. He's an expert in religious law. And so he does what lawyers do. And I'm not running down lawyers. Lawyers are good. I have friends who are lawyers, right? Lawyers, lawyers do what lawyers do, which is they want to define the terms. 
They want to know specifically what is, it, what is it you're talking about. They get into the details and, it, you know, hey, they, they look for loopholes, right? And that's what this guy's doing. He says, okay, Jesus, uh, I get it. The most important commandment, the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God, right? He, so he knows the Shema. We know he's a good Jew. We know he's a good Jewish lawyer he's, because he, he wants to define the term. He says, okay, but who is my neighbor? Jesus. And so Jesus answers him with a story. He, we call it a parable. It's just basically a, a parable is a story with a, like a, 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 a spiritual meaning. You know, the, the moral of the story. Jesus, in answer to his question, who's my neighbor? Jesus tells him this story. You've probably heard it. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up. They left him half dead beside the road. Now, here's the reality. This guy was doing something he should not have been doing. The guy in the story. He was doing something he shouldn't have been doing. Now, that may not be really apparent to us because we don't, you know, that's not our context. But when Jesus first told this story, his hearers would have said, <laughs> what's that guy thinking? When Luke wrote it down and Luke's first readers read that story, their thought would have been, <laughs> What was that guy thinking? You see, because the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho dropped in elevation by 3,600 feet. And that meant that there were all these switchbacks, you know, like you see on mountain roads. And in order to accommodate the drop in elevation, there were these switchbacks. And, and bandits, groups of bandits, roving bandits, would hide in those switchbacks. And when they saw somebody vulnerable, they would attack them. And that's why everybody knew you don't travel this road alone. If you're going to go on the Jerusalem to Jericho road, you do it with some other people because it's not a safe place to do that. Why do I mention this? Because some of your neighbors are doing things they shouldn't be doing and they're experiencing the consequences you would expect them to experience because they're boneheads, right? They're doing things they shouldn't be doing and so they get the consequences that, you know, you'd expect them to get, just like this guy doing something he shouldn't be doing. Okay, don't travel that road alone. You're gonna get attacked and, and, and he does. Look what happens in verse 31. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed him by on the other side. So Jesus introduces us to, to two different people now in this story. There's a priest who has spent his entire life training to become a vocational minister. Right? He's the first century Jewish equivalent of a pastor. And he sees the dude and he's just like, mm, no, don't think so. Not today. Got things to do. Move to the other side of the road and keep right on going. The second guy is a temple assistant. Now, here's a guy who's from the tribe of Levi, and so his grandfather and his father and now him, they're all temple assistants, and they assist the priest who, you know, the priest whose grandfather and his father and him, they're priests, the, the, the temple assistant. That's what they do, right? They, and, and the way it worked in the first century was they were on kind of a rotating schedule. They didn't work at the temple all the time. They didn't serve as priests all the time unless they were part of the, you know, the priestly aristocracy, they would go from time to time, the same way like maybe if you're in the National Guard, you know, you go one weekend a month, two week, weeks in the summer, same kind of thing. They would go and they would serve in the temple and then they go back home and do, you know, whatever it is they did the rest of their time. And so here's what, why I mentioned it. Here's what we know. The, the, uh, the priest and, you know, kind of the rubber, the rubbernecking temple assistant who's like, what is that? Really? All right, the, the priest and the temple assistant have this in common. They're either going to church or coming from church. That's why they're on this road. If you're a priest or you're a Levitical temple assistant, the only reason you're on the Jerusalem to Jericho road is you either, it's your turn and you're going to serve in the temple or you've done your turn and you're coming back home from the temple. They're either going to church or they're coming from church and they're so concerned about going to church that they forgot to be the church. When this dude's laying alongside the road, road and bleeding. And they just cruise right on by. So Jesus introduced us to a third passerby. 
Verse 33, then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Now again, Luke's first readers, Jesus' first hearers, as soon as they heard the word Samaritan, the neurons in their brain began to fire. Samaritan. Because good Jews despised the Samaritans. 622 BC, the Assyrians came down, they invaded Israel, they carried off about 200,000 captives back to Assyria. And to make sure that the land didn't become fallow and overtaken by critters, they brought 200,000 dispossessed people from other nations and they resettled them. Other nations they'd conquered, they resettled them in Israel. And so over time, those refugees from other nations began to intermarry with the Jews who remained in Israel and they formed sort of this this interracial, interspiritual race of people that became known as Samaritans because they lived in an area that was called Samaria. And because they did not maintain their pure Jewish heritage as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible commanded, they were despised by good Jews. And so when Jesus introduces this guy, his listeners are going, uh, where are you going with this, Jesus? So, just to give you an idea about how deep their bias ran against Samaritans. If you've got your analog Bible today, and you know, you've turned to, to, to this passage in Luke chapter 10, there's probably a heading above this passage. Now, the heading is not inspired by God. Not, it's not, not, it's not, wasn't written in Greek. You know, some editor put it in there later. And so, the editor of your Bible, whether it's the New International or the New Living Translation, New American Standard, they put that heading in there later. And that heading says, The Good Samaritan. Now, this is how much of a bias they had. It found its way all the way down to your Bible translator who, you know, in the 21st century, he didn't put a good Samaritan because (laughs) there was only one, apparently. (laughs) The good Samaritan. That's how deep the bias ran against these Samaritans. And he does something that you wouldn't expect because he's a Samaritan after all. Going over to him, verse 34, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own, on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, here's the moral of the story, verse 36. Now, which of these two, Jesus asked, would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Now comes the exclamation point. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. You see, Jesus didn't just mean love your neighbor. Jesus meant love your next door neighbor. It's not just some metaphorical foreigner living somewhere. He meant like the the dude who lives next door to you too. See, we've used this story to expand our concept of who is my neighbor. And I get it because that's kind of what Jesus is doing in the story, right? The guy's looking for loopholes and Jesus is basically saying to him, hey, there aren't any loopholes. There aren't any loopholes. Your neighbor's the person you show mercy to. But in our mind, we've kind of, I think, I think, maybe I'm wrong, and that's okay if I'm wrong, I'm not here next week, right? So uh, I think we've kind of expanded this so much that when we think Jesus says, love your neighbor, well, I love everybody, but that dude next door who won't put his garbage bin, uh, you know, back next to, behind the house after garbage day, I love everybody else, but that dude doesn't pick up what his dog leaves on my lawn, Right? No, what if Jesus didn't just mean love your neighbor, but he meant love your next door neighbor? See, if that's what Jesus means, then it changes some things. Come on now. If that's what Jesus means, then it's gonna change some things in your life and, and, and in my life because that means that if your neighbor is from a different race or a different culture, you love your neighbor. It means if your neighbor makes dumb choices and experiences 
bad consequences. You know the kind I'm talking about, the kind you're just like, what do you expect, dude? What do you expect? Right? If that's your neighbor, love your neighbor. If your neighbor is a left-wing nut job and you are a right-wing conspiracy theorist or vice versa, love your neighbor. Started meddling now, haven't I? Going for preaching the meddling. If your neighbor pulls in the garage at night and clicks the clicker and down comes the door and they don't say two words to you and they make it clear that they don't want to be a part of your life and, and, and it makes it hard, still, nevertheless, love your neighbor. If your neighbor, if your neighbor is a University of Michigan fan, I know. Love your neighbor. If your neighbor is the only Samaritan on the block, or if you're the only Samaritan on the block, love your neighbor. Because here's the truth, and here's what I think it's sometimes difficult for us to admit. It's difficult for us to admit that we're all Samaritans. Because at at one time or another, we've all felt like we were outcasts. We've all felt othered or marginalized. We've all, at one time or another, we've all felt like we're the ones who made the bonehead mistake and now we're reaping the consequences. I don't know what it's like for you, but the hardest person, the, the person in my life, in my life who gives me the most difficulty, the person who causes me the most headache, the person who causes me the most heartache, the person who's the most difficult to deal with in my life is the guy that I shave with every morning. And I'll bet that the person who causes you the most heartache in your life is the person you look at in the mirror too. And you know what? God warned you. He said, don't sin. He said, be holy because I am holy. Through his servant, the apostle Paul, he said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been told not to sin And yet we still do dumb things. And so we get beat up and we get bruised and we get battered. And a lot of times it's because of the dumb things that we've done. And God would have had every right to see us lying there beaten and bruised and bloody because we did something dumb and the bandits attacked us as a consequence. God would have had every right to just walk on by. Told you. So it was going to happen. But he didn't do it. Instead, he sent Jesus. And Jesus moved into the neighborhood. In fact, God said, I want these people to get to know me and who I am. I want them to understand what God is like, that God is love, and that grace can be found through Jesus Christ. And so God said, I'm going to put down roots. I'm going to send my son. Jesus is going to put on flesh and he's going to take the penalty for their sin. And as a consequence, they can be redeemed and reconciled to God. That's what Jesus did for you. He loves you that much. And now when, when, when you think about your neighbor, when you think about your next door neighbor or that neighbor at, in your classroom at school or that neighbor who has the cubicle next to you at work or that neighbor who's beside you on the assembly line. When when, when you think about that neighbor, remember what Jesus did for you and how he showed you mercy and go and do the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of your servant Jesus who showed us what love is like, who told us to love one another, taught us how. Lord, putting down roots can be difficult because um, it can be painful. We can put down roots and we can get hurt. People can betray us. And even when, when there hasn't been some sort of betrayal or difficulty, Lord, 
we put down roots and find we have to pick up and move and say goodbye and goodbyes are hard. God, help us to put down roots anyway. Help us to learn from this Samaritan to show mercy and love in the places where we live and work and go to school. Through Christ we pray, amen.